experience of, of the movements will be there for a very long time in, in, in the Catholic Church. On the other hand, I still believe that the, di the dimension of the parish and of the local territorial church is still very important because, to be very blunt, it's very important for Catholics to sit in a church with people that are, are not like them. The Second Vatican Council sought to empower lay people in the Catholic Church. But how has that materialized over the past 50 years? Church historian Massimo Fagioli points to the new lay movements as the key to answering this question. But, he asks, do the new movements really embody the spirit and essence of Vatican II teaching? The rising laity, ecclesial movement since Vatican II, is a critical and timely analysis, and we're discussing it today on Subject Matter. Massimo Fagioli, it's a great privilege to have you on Subject Matters. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Now, the premise of your book uh, is that any analysis of the role of lay people in the church over the last 50 years has to take into account the birth and development of these ecclesial movements or lay movements. Uh, it's a fascinating development, but let's, let's start from the very beginning. For people who don't even know what a lay movement is, what are the lay movements? What are the ecclesial movements? The lay movements are large or small organizations that gather lay people I in the church with a certain number of uh, clergy. It can be small or large. Uh, and that's new because during the 20th century, they have claimed in different ways, different forms, a certain kind of independence from the territorial church, which was the overwhelming dominant model of organizing uh, uh, the church. Uh, the bishop the, with his diocese and the parish priest with, with the parish. In the 20th century, for different reasons that are social, political, we see lay people increasingly desiring a new way of uh, experiencing the church in a setting, in places that are not necessarily the same ones of the territorial church. So they gather lay people that come from a similar social background, uh, so, uh, like uh, blue collar workers in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, or students more recently, uh, or people with a certain spirituality, certain culture, theological culture. So that's quite new, this kind of uh, claim of the lay people. And before we get into some of the, the, the meatier parts of the book and the analysis, uh, who are we talking about? I mean, you mentioned throughout the book a number of these, of these lay movements, but who are some of the big ones that we need to be thinking about in, our, in this analysis uh, from the top? Big ones that I, I think we should know something about are the international groups that were born in a particular country in a particular time and they have become international, let's say, brands, like the Opus Dei or the Focolare Movement, uh, Communal Liberation, Sant'Egidio, New Catechumenals. These are among the most important, but there are hundreds of different movements. Uh, what marks this, these movements that I, I mentioned at the beginning is that they are international. So they are everywhere and they have a particular impact on the local churches, on the local level, on the national level, and at the global level. So right. that's why they are very important to understand what uh, the church is today. And the main you know, historical and theological reference point uh, in the book is obviously the Second Vatican Council, which was an ecumenical council, a very, very significant uh, moment and paradigm shift, really, in the life of the Catholic Church. Um, from 1962 to 1965 it was in session and it said some very interesting things about lay people. So yeah. what, what did the council say about lay people that has subsequently influenced the development, the birth and development of some of these movements? From the point of view of the ecclesiology, Vatican II said that uh, 
uh, membership in the church is not measured in terms of ordination or of your role, but of your baptism. And that has an immediate consequence on how lay Catholics perceive themselves. Mm. So the Second Vatican Council ecclesiologically uh, is the evidence that these lay movements that were born before, in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, they had something to say. But the role of the Second Vatican Council in this history of the movements is very interesting because many of these movements were created before and many of them after. But what's even more interesting is that Vatican II doesn't talk anywhere explicitly of these new Catholic movements. Right. But they are expression of a conciliar theology, of the theology of the Second Vatican Council. But it's a non-direct link, it's indirect. Mm. So it is interesting to see how they still work on the theology of the Second Vatican Council, but in some cases to go beyond uh, with a more progressive uh, uh, approach. In some of the cases, they have a more nostalgic view and they work on the foundation of the Second Vatican Council, but to look backwards. That's, that's, uh, there's a, an ambivalence in, in them about the Second Vatican Council. Apart from the theological developments that took place at the Council, obviously the Council happened at a particular uh, time in a particular social political context and uh, what happened immediately after the council is very important uh, a key moment being and you talk about this in the book 1968 uh, why was that such an important year in the whole history of this development well because 1968 in Europe especially and the North America is a year of the student movements the student uprising uh, and of political violence uh, and so these Catholic movements uh, must be looked at into the context of church history, but also of the social political history of that time. Um, so for the United States, the, the history of the civil rights movement uh, has a lot in common with this new protagonism of the lay people. If you mm -hmm. remember, I mean, Catholic bishops were very shy or cautious in taking sides in the civil rights movement, and many lay Catholics, they took sides. So in this sense, 1968 is also a shift because it's the first crisis in the post-council period. With Humane Vitae, many lay Catholics uh, are uncomfortable. That's the, enc the encyclical from Paul VI exactly. on birth control. And a family right. and marriage. And, family. That's right. and that is a crisis because many lay Catholics don't feel uh, represented by that teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and so 1968, is a, it is symbolically very important. Um, and it's when the post-council period becomes something different from what council fathers in 65, they expected of a, of a very happy embrace between, between church and modern culture. These movements they witness a more complicated relationship. And wh how did the hierarchy of the church respond to those developments? Uh, and what impact did that have on, on their understanding of the movements and, and supporting them or not supporting them? It's one of the most interesting uh, pages of this research. At the Second Vatican Council, they say nothing uh, about this movement. For almost 10 years uh, or 15 years after Vatican II, these bishops, they are very uncomfortable with these lay people being protagonists. Uh, even in Italy, the National Bishop Conference, they are very afraid with communal liberation until 1975. And then one thing that is typical of the Catholic Church happens also for the movements, the Pope changes his mind and says, we should welcome this movement. And so 1975 for communal liberation, there's a symbolic act of the Pope opening the the a, a big ola mm -hmm. in the in the Vatican for the gathering, and then John Paul II comes, which is really the Pope that changes everything in the approach of the Catholic Church towards this movement. And John Paul II is the most important Pope for the history of the Catholic movement so far. We're going to talk a little bit more about him, uh, but we have to take a short break. And also, what we, when we come back, what Francis thinks about all of this. Don't go anywhere. The new Catholic movements range in charism, theology, and geography. Some of the notable movements that have grown substantially in the post-Vatican II era include Communion and Liberation, 
the community of Sant'Egidio, the Focolari movement, the Neo-Catechumenal Way, Charismatic Catholics, the Cursillo movements, the Emmanuel community. Within a few years, movements and ecclesial groups have taken on an extraordinary role and visibility. And not only because of the increase in their numbers, their international expansion, and their skillful strategies for communication, institutionalization, and penetration of the church hierarchy. Behind this success, there are also specific reasons relating to church politics and a significant shift in papal teaching about them, which often generate tension with the central aspects of the teaching of Vatican II and its ecclesiology in particular. The Rising Laity, Ecclesial Movement Since Vatican II is published by Paulus Press and is available for purchase online at paulispress.com and at Ben McNally Books in Toronto. Here with Massimo Fagioli discussing his book, The Rising Laity. And uh, Massimo, before the break we were talking about the Council, 1968, uh, and then the arrival of John Paul II. And this was a really, really key moment in the life of the, movement, of the movements. Why? What did he do for the movements in his long pontificate? Well, there, there are many different sides to, to that. One side is that John Paul uh, had been very, very active with, with uh, lay Catholics in his in experience before becoming bishop and also a, as a bishop. The second thing is uh, the political factor. Uh, as a bishop in Poland, he saw that the most important opposition to the communist regime came from organized Catholics in Solidarność. That was not something uh, driven or led by the, uh, the bishops. And third, there is an, an ecclesiological appraisal of the importance of these movements because John Paul is really looking for a church of the future of the post-Vatican II and of the third millennium. And he knows very well that the future of the church is not a monopoly of the clergy or of, of the bishops. So there are many different factors that uh, weigh in, in in his big, big role uh, in opening really the the doors uh, to the movements uh, to be protagonists in the church, but what's typical of John Paul II in society, so also mm -hmm. socially, politically active. And the response of the movements to him uh, was very good. They had a, obviously a very good relationship, and many of them would appeal directly to him for affirmation, for guidance, for things like that. So the relationship was a mutual one. That's typical. So when a pope opens the door of the, of the church to, to, to new movements like the monastic orders in the 11th century or the Jesuits in the 16th century, a, a really good relationship starts. What's, what's new in this post-Vatican II movement is that for almost 15 years they felt overlooked uh, or felt uh, treated in an unfair way by the bishops. And so for them seeing the Pope opening those, that was a, b a big game changer. So there is a history of, of, of suffering of these movements were very organized, very active in the church. They didn't feel represented in the Catholic Church. And John Paul captured that. He saw that. And that is something that is very, very important to understand uh, his, his pontificate. Now, it's, it's fascinating that uh, at the heart of this book, at the heart of the research, is how I read it, a great paradox. Uh, you know, you write in the book, I'm going to quote you here, the new Catholic movements represent a phenomenon typical of the post-Vatican II Church. They are an embodiment of the spirit of Vatican II, but at the same time, a challenge to a comprehensive historical understanding of the Council. So the movements as you see them in their history and development over the past 50 years is somewhat paradoxical. They're both a concrete fruit of the Council but there's something about their theology, their essence, that is not really in line with the theology of the laity of the council. Just explain that a little bit more for us. Well, they are representative of the messiness of the, of the, of the, of the post Vatican of the period because they acquire completely the main intuition of the Second Vatican Council. But for example, for what concerns the division that the Vatican II is still very visible between lay persons, uh, ordained, um, the bishops, uh, these classical juridical definitions uh, 
in the Catholic movements right now, they have very little meaning, very little role. And so they use the Vatican II and they unpack it in a very regional way, and every movement has its own way to do that. So for, for, the, for the Focolare movement, is a humanism intelligence dialogue uh, as well as for Sant'Egidio. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other movements. So a, every movement uh, has its own take, and that is part of the great intuition of the Second Vatican Council of the reception. So Vatican II doesn't exist in itself. It must be received by somebody, and they are very important actors in this reception. Mm -hmm. I mentioned the spirit of Vatican II, you know, the, the infamous. Sometimes when I look at the, the, the conversations in the Catholic uh, world about how we define the quote-unquote spirit of Vatican II, it's fascinating. And you point out something really interesting, that the movements are praised often for invoking the spirit of Vatican II, the true spirit of Vatican II. Well, at the same time, there's theologians and historians around the world uh, who have been criticized or even censured for invoking the quote-unquote spirit of Vatican II. Uh, what, what's going on there? What is this debate over the spirit of the Vatican II? Well, in these last few years, uh, there had been this kind of a tendency to see the letter of the Second Vatican Council, those texts, as good, and the spirit, the environment, the culture around there as dangerous. Uh, which is a very wrong way of looking at the Second Vatican Council. If, if we look at what the Synod of 1985 on the reception of the Second Vatican Council said, there in the final report there is a very honest assessment that we need both those texts and the spirit. So what's interesting about these movements is that they, their use of the term spirit has been accepted. But if a theologian or a Catholic historian uses spirit, that becomes suspicious. So that mm -hmm. means that these movements, they have uh, more freedom to, to do and say things as an organization, as a movement, as an association, than me or you individually can do or can say. This is one of the geniuses of the Catholic Church. I mean, uh, Ignatius of Loyola, by himself was dangerous, as seen as suspect, as, as very original. Right. But as soon as he had a group of people, very committed, very organized, it became that part. And in this sense, the, uh, the history of the, of the Catholic movements is a postmodern replica of, of similar phenomena in the early modern period and in, in the medieval times. Fascinating. We, we talked about the influence of John Paul. Did Benedict XVI change anything in regards to what, you know, the, how, the, how the papacy, how the Pope deals with the movements, or was he kind of a c continuation of John Paul II's I strategy? see him more like a continuation or an emphasis on this idea that these movements are essential because the future of the church will not be made of territorial churches, but of committed Catholic com uh, uh, communities. Right. And so in his messages, Pope Benedict uh, was emphasizing even more one aspect of John Paul II. Um, in, in this sense, the John Paul Benedict pontificate uh, has a very clear continuity for what uh, they said on the, on the movements. We have to take one more break, but when we come back, some concluding remarks from Massimo Fagioli. Don't go anywhere. Massimo Fagioli is a professor of theology and religious studies at Villanova University in Philadelphia and is also a contributing editor to Commonweal magazine. His other books include Vatican II, The Battle for Meaning, True Reform, Liturgy and Ecclesiology in Sacrosanctum Concilium, Sorting Out Catholicism, A Brief History of the New Ecclesial Movements, Pope Francis, Tradition in Transition, a Council for the Global Church, Receiving Vatican II in History. The most significant shift from John Paul II and Benedict XVI is Pope Francis's constant call to the movements to see themselves not as the church or the paradigm of a new militant church, but as part of the Catholic Church. Care for the unity of the church, freshness of the charism, and respect for the freedom of the faithful in the movements 
these three elements sum up the recommendations of Pope Francis to the new ecclesial realities. Okay, Massimo, we have to talk about Pope Francis. Uh, the last chapter in your book uh, is sort of a recap of all the things that he has said to and with the movements when he's met with them in his short pontificate. Uh, so where does he stand? How does he see the movements uh, as part of the church and what would he like to see from them? Well, what's new in Francis is that uh, he has kept, of course, the door open for, for the movements, but what he has said repeatedly is that the future of the church is not just with the movements, but it's about finding a balance between parishes, dioceses, and movements. In these terms, what he says is quite new also because Francis has said very honest words on some dangers of the movement's dynamics, like uh, the, the danger of uh, psychological control on people who, who might look into a movement for personal issues, psychological issues. So that's new, he's, he's being very honest. And that comes from his being a Jesuit. I mean, uh, the Jesuits, they start as a movement in the 16th century and coming from Latin America. Uh, his, exper his, his experience as a pastor is with a church that is not necessarily in line always with the institutional church in Argentina, in Latin America in the 60s, 70s. Uh, he has learned a, a lot uh, by them uh, and from that experience. One of the messages that you bring up a couple of times, uh, Pope Francis, is this whole theme of unity and diversity. Yeah. And this is something that he really wants to see from the movements. He wants to see them recognize this, that uniformity is not Catholic. Uh, and that that's, he sees, I think, in them a tendency sometimes to be a little bit exclusivist. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that. How, where is that coming from in him? I think Pope Francis uh, has heard, has seen, that the movement's experience can create division locally. Uh, we scholars and, also, and many Catholics know that that ha has happened in these last few years as it has happened in church history. So he wants to find the middle ground. And so what's typical of, of physical theology in Evangelii Gaudium is this emphasis on unity and at the same time a unity that is not conformity, is not but it's not conformity, not even within a movement. Mm. So, so what's interesting about him is, is, is that this diversity thing, he, he says that it's, it's important also within one same movement, where sometimes we see that some dynamics, the respect of the leader, of the founder, can drive people to what has been called ticket mentality, that, that you conform. So this is not uh, this is not Pope Francis' vision of uh, of, the, of the of the church, and in 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 that there is a sincerity, a honesty that he is showing, and that it, that John Paul and the, and Benedict they were more confident in the ability of the movements to regulate themselves. So what's typical of Francis is that he has cautioned them not to become exclusivist, not to take over local churches. Uh, that's very, very interesting. Mm. I want to talk about uh, the rest of us, most of us. You know, you and I are sitting here, we're both lay Catholics, we're not a part of movements. Uh, and you write in the book that, that the whole development of movements and how they've uh, sort of been at the forefront of the development of laity's role in the Catholic Church. You say that the rest of the local church and Catholics not active in the movements are left in a sort of dead zone, uh, which is very interesting. So if we're to interpret Vatican II's theology of the laity in a way that would be beneficial for all laity at this particular time, what would that look like? What about the rest of us? Where do we fit into all of this? Well, I, I think that the experience of, of the movements will be there for a very long time in, in, in the Catholic Church. On the other hand, I still believe that the, the, the dimension of the parish and of the local territorial church is still very important because, to be very blunt, it's very important for Catholics to sit in a church with people that are, are not like them, mm 
uh, with whom they don't necessarily agree politically, uh, that they don't like their social views. This is something that is more difficult to find in, in a movement where usually you create a very warm temperature uh, spiritually, but also interpersonally. Right. And the Catholicity means also conflict. And in the local church, the total church, there is this ability to manage conflict that in the movements can be dealt with a, in a different way. And so I, I, I think that uh, what, what Francis is bringing um, is a message on, on, on both sides, that we need a movement kind of energy, but also uh, the humility of being a, a church that is rooted in a particular place with, with people that may not have our same energy to do things, social work, this kind of thing. Uh, but it's the people of God is made of very different kind of people. Sounds like the theology of Vatican II to yes. me. Yeah, Massimo Fagioli, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, thank you. The book is The Rising Laity, Ecclesial Movement Since Vatican II by Massimo Fagioli, Professor of Theology and Religious Studies at Villanova University. You can get the book right here at Ben McNally Books in Toronto or from our good friends over at Paulist Press. Just visit Press. Com. You can follow Massimo, all of his work, all of his commentary on the church on Twitter. His handle is at Massimo Fagioli. He's also a contributing editor for Commonweal. You can find them at commonwealmagazine.org. And remember, if you want to see my video review of The Rising Laity, you can check it out on our website, saltandlighttv.org slash subject matters. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you again next time. Subject Matters with Sebastian Gomes is sponsored by the Cullen family. Our Salt and Light team works hard to bring you quality Catholic programming like Subject Matters. Please consider supporting our mission by making a donation today. Thank you for your generosity and remember, our hope begins with you.